tonight. May thy great Holy Spirit, Lord, come tonight in power and perform great miracles among us, healing the sick, calling home to the shelter in a time of storm those who are weary along the road. May those who have wandered off the beaten path come back tonight and be reconciled to God. Grant it, Lord. And when we leave tonight, we pray that you'll do something among us that will be so outstanding that'll make us go to our home saying like those coming from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way. For we ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. May be seated. Thank you, Brother Lord. We are, these letters, we pray over them. We appreciate your confidence in our prayers. Some of them are stamped, some that come to the, to the place I'm staying. I don't, they don't stamp, so we're putting them right back just as quick as we possibly can. Had a wonderful night last night, did we not? The Holy Spirit blessed us. Now I see down in the, the orchestra pit here people on the stretchers and cots. Now, just make it in your mind now that this is the last night you're going to suffer. You're going to go home tonight to be well. You're going to just believe that in your heart. You'll not be disappointed. Usually we receive what we expect to see, just what we expect. If I could come down in that little pit and take you people out of there and make you well, I'd do it. I'd just be so happy to do that. But I can't do it. I'm just a man, like this man here, and I, I wish I could, but I know that our Lord is here, and he's the one who can make you come off of the stretchers and go home and be well. I trust that he will. Not only that, but all you out to the audience. Very nice seeing this nice audience tonight, nice crowd of people, and our precious brother has already spoke the word, and I just want to take a few minutes now, as each night... I do not try to preach at night just to kind of give a little drama till I get the feeling of the audience. I'm sure you understand what I mean. And then, if the Lord willing, I want to preach Sunday afternoon on the subject as the eagle stirs her nest and hovereth over her young. That is, if the Lord permits. Sunday afternoon. Now tonight, just uh, till we get kind of acquainted, and all this is spiritual. I look at you as human beings like myself, but each one of you has a spirit. And then when the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes, it's like a breath almost. And you can feel belief, unbelief, and what more. Now you say, that's psychology, Brother Brown. Maybe it is. If it is, our Lord used it. Because he, he took a man outside the city one time to pray for him. And then another time... We know that there was a dead girl in the house, and the people were making a great lamentation over it. And he put the people out, and just left the parents, and Peter, James, and John, and himself, and he raised the, the girl from the dead. See, there's something about it. Each one you're looking, your eye is a gate to your soul. You look at it, it almost governs the other senses. You look at it before you taste it, you look at it before you smell it, feel it, and so forth. It's usually the eye is the gate to the soul. And when you're watching, and if you could only let that be a blessing to you, when you see with your own eyes, hear with your own ears, the Lord Jesus moving among the people and doing things that he has been doing, it should make you have real faith. Now, you won't see him in a physical body until he comes for you at the great general resurrection. Then we'll see him, and then we'll know as we're knowing seem as he is. That's the hour we're all longing, waiting for, that time. Until that time, his spirit is here, and the church is becoming more like him all the time. From the great first Reformation in Luther, church had a wide stretch, that was still the Holy Spirit, moving in the days of Luther. Then he come into the minority again when it, John Wesley, sanctification, the second work of grace, he called it. And then along come the Pentecost, the restoration of the gifts still narrowed down. 
and it's narrowing on out now until the church in Christ will become one. When it does, the coming of the Lord will be, and the resurrection of all the rose that sleep in him shall rise. Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, all that's got his spirit will rise to meet him in the air. God grant that time right away. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I was just on my mind, I must say it. I had a case of that year some time ago that I went into a, a city we were holding a meeting in somewhere in Ohio. I can't think of the place right now. And it was having a great meeting, so much that I went out into the country to stay in a little motel. There's a little Dunkard restaurant just across the road, the nicest, cleanest looking little women worked in there, and so Christian-like. And I'd been fasting for about three days, and the brethren went on to service. I was to preach that Sunday afternoon. I wasn't going to have a healing service, and I was kind of a little hungry, so I thought, I'll go over to the little restaurant, but they'd closed up and gone to church. It was Sunday. And just the other side of the road, a filling station and a common little ordinary American restaurant like there, a little sandwich shop. This is horrible, I have to say this, but it's true. And when I walked in, there was a policeman standing about my age, surely married, and had his arm around a woman playing a slot machine. Gambling's illegal in Ohio. And there he was gambling. I thought, well, the law. I looked back at the back, and some of those boys, deep neck kind with them long hair hanging on their neck and, and overhaul jackets and, oh, and pull down, you know, or clothes down on their hips, were standing there with their arm around about a 16-year-old waitress, where they ought not have had. I thought, oh, mercy. And I looked to my right, there was a man, summertime, with a big overcoat on, government overcoat, big gray scarf around his neck. Another man sitting by him was an, an old woman, old enough to be my grandmother. And she had this manicure on her face, or what you call the stuff, a little black... I say that wrong every time. What is it you call that? It's so, uh, it, somehow, I tell you, it doesn't belong on Christians. And that's one thing, sure. I'm a missionary. That's a heathen tree. That's exactly right. Pentecostal people used to not do it, but I don't know what happened. <laughs> they used to not cut their hair, but I don't know what happened. Somebody let down a bar somewhere. <laughs> they used to say a little song, an old Methodist preacher used to sing, We let down the bars, we let down the bars, we compromise with sin. We let down the bars, the sheep got out, but how did the goats get in? <laughs> the answer, you let down the bars. <laughs> Poor thing, blue-looking hair. Sitting there, and a little bitty sh short cl clothes on that a man would have been shamed to have on, and sitting there, and she was drunk. And I looked around. I thought, Oh mercy! I thought, God, how can you, how can you, being holy and righteous, ever look upon such as that? It looks like you just smite the thing off. Does my little Sarah and Rebecca have to be raised up such as that? And the two men excused themselves and walked away. They would be back in a few moments, they said. And I was sitting there looking at the woman, criticizing her with all that was in me, and thinking, what a horrible thing. But many times, we shouldn't do that. We don't know what's the inside story. And it happened to be, God taught me a lesson right there. I just stepped back behind the door. Something said, move back. And while I knelt down to pray, I looked and saw a vision of the world turning like this. It looked like a crimson spray around it. And I seen myself as it was first standing on the earth, and every time I would do something wrong, my sins would start up to God, but Jesus act as a bumper to keep me my sins from getting to God. And every time I would do something wrong, then look like it my sins would go towards God, and then Jesus would catch it, and I'd see the tears running off of his cheeks and blood down over his face, and he'd look up and say, Father, he doesn't know what he's doing. Forgive him. And it, like that, and I thought, is that my sins doing that? And I went up close to him, I looked, and there's a book laying open. My sins were awful on it. And I said, dear Lord Jesus, you mean that my sins is what hurt your sides and made tears in your eyes and, and blood in your face? He said, it is. I said, please forgive me. And he touched his side, wrote across the book, pardon. 
throw it over behind him. And I said, oh, I'll ever be grateful to you. And when he did, he said, I forgive you, but you want to condemn her. And when he did that, I was looking back at the woman again. I walked over where she was. I said, how do you do? She was drinking quite extensively, and I said, she looked up at me, and she said, oh, how do you do? And I said, could I sit down? She said, I've got company. And I said, not like that. I just want to tell you something. And I sat down and told her. And I looked at her, and she was crying. And I said, aren't you ashamed? She said, who are you? Are you this minister down here in the army? I said, yes, ma'am, Brother Brandon. She said, I'm ashamed to face you, Brother Brandon. She said, my father was a Methodist minister. I got a, two daughters. One of them is a real renowned Christian. The other is a Sunday school teacher. And she told me the story of a drunken husband and what she started. She said, there's no hopes for me. I said, if there's no hopes for you, why did God show me that vision? And there I took her by the hand, knelt down there beside that booth, and led her to the Lord Jesus right there in that room. When I got up, the policeman was standing there, and that girl was standing back there crying, and made a difference. You see, we must look at things the way they are. So we don't know what's behind the story. Let us turn now to St. Luke, the 18th chapter, 38th verse. <clears throat> I'd like to read this just for a little talk before we pray. Okay, for the sake. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Our scene opens at the north gate of the city of Jericho, A.D. 33. It must have been a cold morning. He was late. He had been dreaming all night that he could see. And he got up late, made his way to his little station or post where he begged. And all in that day there was many beggars. If they didn't get to the gates early when the people were coming in to their business in the city, why, well, they had to catch the person. Maybe they could afford one coin a day to a beggar. But they're all gone in seemingly now, and there he was left alone. He couldn't hear no one on the road. He looked to hear, I mean, listened to hear someone coming. No one was coming. So he goes over and gets him a rock and sat down. And began to think of the night when he was dreaming. Then he remembered that warm uh, Palestinian sun began to warm him up a little in his ragged coat as he sat on this rock near the wall, just out of the shadow. And he had his wrinkled face turned towards the ground. And he might have been thinking something like this. His mind went back to many years on that same hillside or near Jericho as a little boy. When he could see and how he used to love to run up and down the hill and pick little buttercups in the early spring and lay down on the hillside and watch the white clouds go by and the blue skies reflecting. What a beautiful world it was, and now he's old and everything is gone and he's blind and begging for his living. How cruel it seemed like nature had been to him. And while he was thinking on that, he remembered of how that his mother used to call him from across the hill. Here along about two o'clock in the afternoon, call him in, and after he'd had his midday lunch, he would, she'd set out on the side porch that faced off towards the Jordan River. And she would get him in her arms, and she would stroke his little dark Jewish curls back and, and kiss him and say, Barney Mayus, you are the sweetest little boy in all the world. I am so glad that you're my little boy. And how he would look and see her pretty cheeks and the big brown eyes as they would smile to him as she would uh, hug her little boy to her cheeks and kiss him and... And he used to love to hear her telling stories before she rocked him to sleep. One of his favorite stories was about a little boy. Once in the Bible time, she'd tell him the story of a great mighty prophet that lived by the name of Elisha that wore the mantle of Elijah with a double potion of his spirit. 
and how that this man was a great servant of God, how God honored his prayers and honored those who honored him. And he passed through a certain city, and there was a woman in this city that was a great woman, not a Hebrew, but she was a Shunammite, but she honored that man because he was a great man of God, and she believed in God. And how she would tell him of the courtesy the great woman would have him stop in and eat with she and her husband. One day she said to her husband, I perceive that this man that dines with us when he's coming through, going up to his cave in the mountain at Mount Carmel to pray, I perceive that he is a godly man, a holy man, a great man of God. I think we ought to do something for him. And they would uh, said, I pray thee, on the side of our house here, let us build him just a little house to himself, that he feels embarrassed perhaps to come in and eat with us all the time, so let's just put him a little table out there, and a, a little wash basin, and a little candlestick, and a bed, a chair that he can rest in, and he can refresh himself as he comes by. And when the great prophet came by and found this, it just blessed his soul to see that she loved God well enough to honor his servant. So she then, the prophet said to his servant, Gehazi, go ask her if I could speak to the chief captain or some favor I could do for her. And the servant came back and said, no, she says she dwells among her own people and she has need of nothing. Thank you, just the same. But Gehazi said, her husband is old, and they have no children. So it must have been God gave the prophet a vision. Then when he said, call her to the door, and when she stood in the door, the aged old prophet raised up and said, Thus saith the Lord, according to the time of life, you will bear a son. Yet the woman could not see how that could be possible. But in the time appointed, she had a nice little boy, and how she loved this little boy. And I can hear her say, Barnimaeus, you know, little boys and girls are God's blessings to a family. It's something about it that ties the family together. You see, Barnimaeus, God gave that lonesome woman a little boy. And God gave you, Barnimaeus, to hubby and I, your daddy. And now you are a little treasure here at home. Oh, we love you so much. And he'd put his little arms around her neck and hug her. There he was now, wrinkled and old, and she'd been gone for years. Then she would tell the story how the little boy wanted to follow his father. So just like you, Bonnie Ness, go out into the field, and one day, must have been about noon time, high noon in Palestine, and the sun must have stroked him because he screamed, my head, my head. His father sent him home, and he sat on his mother's lap until about noon time, and he died. But how God dealt with that woman, how she took him and went over to that little place and laid him on the bed where the prophet had laid, God's representative, laying him on the bed. She saddled a mule and went to Mount Carmel. The prophet did not know what her trouble was. He sent Gehazi and said, go see what's wrong with the Shunammite. She's got sorrow in her heart and God has hid it for me. God don't tell his prophets everything. He just tells his servants what he wants them to know, nothing else. See, they can't make God tell them anything. God just says what he wishes to say. And then how did the, the servant taken the Elijah start to go lay on the baby, but the woman held on. She knew that God was in that prophet, and she said, I'll not leave you. She wanted to know why that God gave her the baby and then took it away. But you see, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. She'd teach Barnabas those lessons. Then he would stop and say, How could it be to the good that I'm blind, man? But mother, no doubt, was right. Then he went on with his dream. And after a bit, he began to think again. Now, you know, Elijah went into that room, walked back and forth, up and down on the floor, went and laid his body on that little dead baby, and the baby sneezed seven times, and it came to life. Oh, how his little eyes would brighten and say, Mama, is that God still living? Oh, yes, dear. He lives right here in these hills of Judea. He stays right around his people. He never leaves them. That was ringing down in his heart. All night he had dreamed of having his side again. 
He thought, oh, how glorious it would be here if I could see the autumn leaves are falling. If I could once more look around. Blindness is a horrible thing. The whole world is shut off to you, the visible world. And there was sitting there, and then he used to think of another great story. His mother was sitting on the porch, facing off the Jordan, and she'd say, Bonnie Mills, just right down there, less than a half a mile, just below the ford, in the month of April, when all the snows had melted and the river was way up here in the, in the valley, God led his people to the other side. And then open up the way and come across Jordan on dry land. And he would think of them stories and say, Oh, but alas, wonder what happened to that great God. Our priest tells us that the days of miracles is past. Those things can't happen no more. That's what's the trouble today. We have too much of that saying that God was but isn't now. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just as much God today as he was then, and he always will be God. If he ever was God, he'll always be God. He cannot die. He, he cannot get old. He cannot change his mind. He cannot make new decisions on things he's already made decisions on. His first decision was right and has to forever be right, or he made the wrong decision when he made it. See, he has to ever keep with his first decision. He's perfect, infinite, and cannot change. Oh, that's a consolation that we must have. Anybody seeking God must have that firm consolation that God cannot change. I can say something, say, I'm sorry I said it. I might have been wrong. But he can't say that because he's perfect. He's infinite. We're finite. We can make any kind of a mistake, but he can't. And if he ever was called on the scene to heal a person and he healed that person according to their faith, the next time he's called, he's got to heal the next one and the next one and everyone that ever comes to him. If he's called on the scene to save a person and he saves him up on his faith, everyone that calls with faith, he has to save. That's right. And remember, when God gives you a call, blessed are you when you feel God calling. Because no man can come to me except my Father calls him first. It's God knocking at your heart's door. What if he never did knock? Think of it, what a horrible thing that would be. But God gives everyone a chance. You turn it down yourself. While Barney Mayus was sitting there, all at once he heard the coming of a little mule's hoofs coming down, the big cobblestones coming down from towards Jerusalem. Oh, he thinks this must be a, a rich man coming. About the only way of travel then was by foot or by donkey, and, and the rich people could ride a mule. He must have said, this must be a place... I can get an arm. So he throws back his arms, running towards the street, or towards the highway, saying, Have mercy on me. I am a blind man. I overslept this morning. I haven't a coin. My winter's wood is not in. There's no meal in the barrel. Would you please help me? And the servant stops the little mule, and he hears a, a gruff voice saying, Out of my way, beggar. I am the servant of the Lord. I'm a priest from Jerusalem. There's to be a fanatic so-called prophet in here today to have a healing service. Out of my way. We're going to take the ministerial association down here and see if nothing like that happens in our city. We don't want none of that down here. We don't have such things as that down here. You know what? Out of my way, beggar. I must be on my way. And the little mule moved on. Barney Mayus finds his way back. Now the sun had raised way up and the shadow of the wall had went back a little way. So he found him a rock near the gate, feeling around the old stones that where the walls had fell, and it sat down on the stone. And he thought, where was I dreaming about my boyhood when I could see, when I was a little boy, I was thinking of a great Jehovah God that once was. Oh, surely God's servant wouldn't act like that. What was that he said to me about a prophet? Oh, I guess I didn't get it. And on, he sat down and thought, well, you remember years ago, my mother has told me many times that right down that same road, over those same stones, come Elijah and Elijah, arm in arm, going to open up the Jordan. Right over the same stones, not 20 yards from where he was sitting. 
One day, two great prophets walked arm in arm to the Jordan. Same road, same stone. Oh, if I could have lived then, I would have run out there and said, Great servants of the Lord God, just ask God, God will hear your prayers. My eyes will come open like that little boy standing here last night, born blind. My eyes will come open and I'll be able to see and I can work and, and make a living and so forth. If, but alas, those prophets are gone. They say there's no more prophets and there's nothing else left and Jehovah has forsaken us and there's no more days of miracles just passed and he just expects us to live for heaven above and when we die we'll go up there but there's no help for us anymore. And I believe if I would have went out there to Elisha and Elijah, I would have not been treated by them servants of the Lord like I was for this one just passed by. I believe they would have considered my case and at least offered a word of prayer for me as they passed by. You know, as a servant of God, you ought to watch what you're doing because your written epistles read of all men. You Christians always be willing to land a hand or to do something to help somebody make life a little ple more pleasant for them. You say, well, I, I don't have any gift of healing. You don't have to have. At least offer something. Offer a prayer. Do something. Make them feel. Do the best you can by them anyhow. Never turn a shoulder, a cold shoulder to anyone. No matter what it is, even if they've mistreated you, do it anyhow. If you can't do it from your heart, then you ought to come to the altar and stay till that spirit comes in you. That from your heart you can love those who doesn't love you. That's when God will answer your prayer. For as long as there's anything in your heart, if I conceive iniquity in my heart, then God will not hear me. That's what David said, and that's, that's true. He won't hear you. Then Elijah had passed by there, and Elisha going down, but the poor blind man had been taught that the days of miracles were past. Then he remembered after Joshua had crossed over the Jordan that about 500 yards from where he was sitting, Israel camped, made their camp. And one day, that great, mighty warrior, Joshua, who took Moses' place to lead the children into the Promised Land, and when he was out one day walking around looking at the walls of Jericho, which was his first objective, to take that city. They was all in the doors closed and there big rocks hanging on top to throw off at him when they come up. And he was wondering just how did he be able to take that city because it was given to them and just what would be the way that God had planned to do it. And he happened to look standing before him. There stood a mighty warrior with his sword drawn. And Joshua drew his sword, went out to meet him. He said, Are you for us? Are you for our enemies? And the sword glistened over his head. He said, Nay, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. The mighty Joshua threw his sword on the ground, took off his shield, laid it down his helmet, and fell to his feet in front of him. And then blind Barney may have stopped. You know what? That happened just right out here. That great captain of the Lord's host was standing on the ground right out there. But the days of the miracles is past. Little did he know that less than a hundred yards from him stood that same captain Amen. of the host of the Lord making his way out. It's when we think of God, when we begin to dream dreams of being well, when we dream dreams of being saved, when we get to thinking about our sins and how cruel it is before God, that's when he draws near us. That's when these disciples, brokenhearted, going on the road to Emmaus, that Jesus stepped out of the bush and began to talk to them while they were thinking of him. You see, the trouble today, we got so much money and stuff on our mind, God can't have a place to get in our thinking. We want to go downtown, shop for new dresses or new hats or something or another, and we got to see Susie and John. We're going to play cards tonight. We can't go to church tonight because we love Susie on or something like that. The television programs, we got everything else on our mind. The churches has got so many orders and things to keep us so busy. Prayer meetings is left out. We need to draw nigh unto God so he'll draw nigh unto us, friends. That's right. But everything else is tucked to place of the prayer meetings. 
Everything else is such the place of the real spiritual worship. Oh, maybe two or three minutes in church, but I just love to lay and bathe before him. And he, don't you love that? Oh, just lift up your hands and drink from the fountain until you just can't drink no more. Just bubbling over in his sweetness and his goodness. I was talking to a noted evangelist, my brother, T.O. Osborne. He said, I was thinking, Brother Branham, of how that, that my whole objective is to save souls and give all my time to save souls to Christ. So then I happen to think, what, a, what about my own love and devotion to Christ? Christ loves him, too. He loves us. We put a lot of time in things, but God wants us to come apart and just sit down and worship him and talk with him. Talk it over. I love that. Oh, that sweetness, that's the greatest time of anybody's life, is just to sit down and meditate. Take everything off your mind. If you would do that, there wouldn't be so much nervousness around the country. If we would just think on God. Draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. While our blind beggar sat down on that cold morning shivering and the warm sun trying to bathe his back, and he thought of that great, mighty warrior that stood right outside the gates from where he was sitting and talked to Joshua and gave him all the instructions how the walls would fall at the sounding of the trumpet and so forth. He was thinking, but that, that great God can't die. He's forever alive. Just about that time he heard a noise. That same great chief captain was on his road out the gate coming to Jerusalem. And you know, there's something about it. Where Jesus is, there's usually a lot of noise. I don't know why, but it makes a lot of noise. You know, the high priest, when he went in to the holiest of holies, he had he was anointed with a, a perfume and with anointing oil. And on his, the hem of his garment, they had a pomegranate and a bell. And every time he walked, that played, Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. And the only way that they know he was alive when he was back in the Holy of Holies, because there was a noise. I wonder if there isn't some deadness somewhere. All right. That's the only way they know he was alive, because he was making a noise back in there. They were listening to see if there was still life in there when he went into the Holy of Holies. And when Jesus came forth, out of the gate there come a great multitude rushing and perhaps run over the poor old beggar. He was blind and he said, what's going on? What's the matter? Nobody paying any attention to him. And he heard the, somebody saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to him that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Women were screaming. Men were screaming. Then he could hear others mocking and making fun. Then he heard the the head of the association of Jerusalem, that priest, screamed out and said, Say, you fake prophet. They tell me you raised a dead man. We've got a whole graveyard full of them up here. Come up and raise these. Let us see you do it. But you see, Jesus never did mind devils. He just let them go on. He, had, he minded the Father. What, he did what the Father showed him to do. And, and he didn't turn any stones to bread. They put a rag around his face one time and hit him on the head. Said, now, if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. We'll believe you. If put a rag, and he never opened his mouth and said a word. Hang it on the cross. They said, tear your hands loose. Come down off the cross if you be Christ. He could have done it. Sure he could. He could have done it. But if he had done it, he had been minding the devil. That's right. So as Billy Sunday said, one time said, every tree had 50 angels sitting in it. So just, just... Tie your hand loose and point towards us. And we'll change this scene here in a few minutes. K. Ephesus said, He saved others himself he can't save, not knowing he was giving him the greatest compliment he ever had. If he saved himself, he couldn't save others. So he gave himself that he could save others. I'm glad that he was able to resist the temptation of the devil. Jesus, when you hear people say, Let me see him heal this one. Let me see him heal that one. Just know that's the devil. That's the same boy. See? There's an old man down here on the corner. He's got uh, sales pencils. I know he's a good old fellow. Come down and heal him. Let me see your divine healers do that. Just remember, that's the voice of the devil. That's right. Just remember. That's what the scripture says. And there's a lot of them. It's just a lot like that. But, of course, devils don't die. The, the devil takes his man, but never his spirit. God takes his man, but never his spirit. The battle goes on just the same. And then 
This crowd rushed out and they screamed at him and this, that. And finally he said, what's going on? What is wrong? What is wrong here? What's all this rush about? What's all the noise? No one was paying any attention to him. And I believe, let's think it was a nice little believer on the Lord Jesus. Maybe a little lady stepped down, a poor old fella. And you know, people that follow Jesus have sympathy for people like that. Followers of Christ. Stepped down, picked the old fella up and said, Sir, ha- have they pushed you off of the rock here? Yes, miss. Uh, uh, what's going on? Oh, you don't understand. No. Well, did you ever uh, hear of Jesus of Nazareth? I don't believe I ever did, said Barney Mayes. Well, Jesus of Nazareth is that great prophet that Moses said would be raised up among us of our own people. He's passing by. Oh, if you could have seen him, I'm sure he would have restored your sight. Oh, where's he at? Oh, he's about a hundred yards or two down the road. He raised up. Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Some of them said, oh, shut up. You make so much noise, you give me a headache. The rest of them around here hollering also, shut up. Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I don't believe he could have heard his voice. There's too much screaming and going on. But he knew that if he was that prophet of God, he could be touched. I believe maybe he slipped down and said, Oh, Lord God, please stop him. Please, Lord, be merciful to me while mercy is passing by. And Jesus stopped, looked back. I believe it. The woman touched his garment. He felt virtue go from him. That's the same Jesus just a few days later. He is not his... His screaming stopped him, but his face stopped him. And the Bible says Jesus stood still. Oh, brother. When a faith of a blind beggar can stop him still in his tracks. A man that was sitting outside the gate, excommunicated from, from uh, what we'd say, society. And he was a beggar and poor and ragged, blind and miserable. But his face stopped the Son of God. What was on the Son of God? He was on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified for the sins of the world. The whole weight of every sin that was ever committed in the world laid upon his precious shoulders. His head was in the air. Overripe and fruit and vegetables was being thrown at him. Away with such a man. Others hollered, Hosanna, Hosanna. The other hollered, Come raise the dead. Show us something you can do. Such a confusion as that. But he kept his face towards Jerusalem. He knew he was going there to die for the people that was crying for his blood. Could you imagine what that was? His own children crying for the Father's blood. That's exactly right. And then, with all that upon his shoulders, with all that facing him, and he knew he'd come to do that, yet the cry and the prayer and the faith of that one old blind beggar stopped him still in his tracks. And he turned around and he said, Your faith has saved you. Oh, my. Thy faith has saved thee. I can hear someone say, Be of a good cheer. Be of a good cheer. He goes on down the road. He stands. He said, What did he say to me? What did he say now? Thy faith has saved thee. Standing looking. After a while, he began to see his fingers. Something was happening. His faith was being confirmed. Your faith can stop him tonight. In the great rush, the coming of the Lord Jesus, and all that there is, there's not a person in here too poor, or too ragged, or too insignificant. You're not too low in morals or life. Or what you can stop him right where he's at now, and he'll stand and call you. Some time ago, I was taking a little lesson on Barney Mayus that said that he had been blind for many years. He had a wife and a little girl. One night, his wife got real sick, and he, he went out and prayed. He said, Lord, heal my wife, and if you'll let my wife get well, he had, he had to do something to make it little enchantments for the public, or you'd never be able to stop them, like in India. Brother Osborne, if you're here tonight, you understand what I mean. They got a little monkey or something or another that they have to do to, or have a, 
a clover snake or some kind of a something enchantment to stop tourists to get money when they pass by. And they said Barney Mayus had two little turtle doves and they done little tumbles over each other. And that would attract the attention of the, uh, the pass by tourists and the people coming in out of the city. He said, Lord, I love my wife. If you let her get well, tomorrow I'll give you them two turtle doves for sacrifice. Well, his wife got well, and he took the turtle doves for sacrifice. Then later on, his little girl that he had never seen in his life, she'd been born since he was blind, about 12 years old, said she had real pretty golden hair, it's a little story, of course, and said that she got sick one night, and the doctor had been there and said, Barney Mayus, she's got a fever, she will just can't live with this kind of fever. And after the doctor left, he felt his way outside the house when the wind was blowing around by the rose bush. And he looked up to where he thought God would be, and he said, Father, I don't have nothing. I have one thing left, and that's my lamb. And today you see, and I forget what they call it, when a dog leads a blind man, and a blind leads a blind, the blind dog leads a blind, or the dog leads a blind man. In them days, they had a lamb that led the blind. And instead of uh, a dog, they trained the lamb. Barney Mayus had a lamb and led him over to his place where he begged. And he said, Lord, if you will just let my little girl get well, I'll take my lamb and I'll sacrifice it for you. And the little girl got well. And the next day he is on his road to take the lamb up to the church to the sacrifice block. And the priest was standing up at the, up on the banisters of the building. He said, Word goes out, blind Barney Mayus. He said, I go to the temple to sacrifice this lamb unto the Lord. Oh, he said, blind Barney Mayus, you cannot sacrifice that lamb. Here, I'll give you the price of the lamb and you buy it out of the stalls and sacrifice it. He said, I never promised God a lamb. I promised him this lamb. He said, blind Barney Mayus, but you can't do that. That lamb is your eyes. He said, if I'll keep my word to God, God will provide a lamb for blind Barnabas' eyes. This cold November day, that's what God had done, had provided a lamb for blind Barnabas' eyes. May I say this tonight, my dear brother, sister, that same lamb is provided for you and for me. God has provided a lamb of our eyes of understanding. For our, this lamb was provided for our healing. He was provided so that his spirit could live among us through this day to bring Christ in a reality to us. God's lamb is provided. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Let us pray. Gracious God, full of mercy and truth, Thou, the stream of all my comfort, said blind Fanny Crosby, more than life to me, whom have I on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? And she screamed out again, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Dear Jesus, that is our humble plea tonight. Do not pass by this auditorium here in Tulsa tonight without stopping, Lord, and visiting us. We love you with all of our hearts. We praise thee with all that is within us. And we believe that you are the same great chief captain the captain of our salvation. And we are looking for you to come in glory someday, bringing with you the host of angels, and to receive your precious church that's been called out of the world and washed in your blood, bearing in their body your name. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will grant tonight that if there be one in your arm many, I do not know their hearts, thou dost. If they do not know you as their precious Savior and feel that warmth of fellowship, God, let it come to pass at this very hour that they will receive thee 
and love thee, and you will draw nigh unto them. May they think on thee now and be drawn nigh. Grant it, Lord. May there not be a sinner, boy, girl, man, or woman walk out of here tonight. May there not be a backslider walk out tonight for what has come to God and had their sins forgiven. May they cry in their heart, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Grant it, Lord. While we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder in this visible audience tonight, I want you to be real honest and everybody pray. Pray especially for those who doesn't know Christ now. Is there any here while you're praying? Would just like to lift up your hand. You're on the bottom floor. Lift up your hand, not to me, but to him, and say, Thou son of David, I've trespassed against thee. I've broken thy commandments. Be merciful to me at this hour. Would you raise your hand so I can just see and pray for you? God bless you. God bless you. All down along the floor here. Over to my right. God bless you. Raise your hand. Say, pray for me, Brother Branham. God bless you. That's good. God bless you. I trespass against thy laws, O Lord. I want you to be merciful to me. God bless this man laying here and this cot laying here. God grant tonight that you can go home and be well, sir. Up in the balconies to my right, would raise your hands. God bless you, lady. God bless you. That's good. Someone else, raise your hand. Just slip up your hand while every eye closed and everyone praying. Let it be just the Holy Spirit and I, if you will. The balconies to the to the center here. Would there be any up there would raise your hand say, pray. God bless you, sir. God bless you. That's good. The balcony to my left. Raise your hand. God bless you, lady. I, God bless you, young fella. That's a great stand for a teenager. God, that's the greatest thing you ever done, son. You might have done many a great thing, but that's the greatest. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. I want your mercies now. Now or in my death, I want you to receive me into your kingdom. I don't know when that will be. Maybe before the service closes tonight. Maybe before I get home, one of these nights somewhere, someplace, sometime a day or night, you're going to feel the pulse coming up your sleeve. It's all then. Oh, my, don't let it happen until you know the Lord Jesus as your own dear personal Savior. It will be another now before we pray. Anywhere, boy, girl, man, or woman, God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, be merciful. Now they, they've raised their hands crying. Thou Son of David, be merciful to me. And may they this very hour receive Jesus as their personal Savior. May he come in great power in their life. This young man up here, Lord, that raised his hand, something's dealt deeply with my heart on that boy. I pray, Father, maybe you're calling a minister to the service. Oh, I pray that you'll bless him and all these others that raise their hands, young and old, may they receive Jesus just now as Savior. Then go out of here and be baptized in some good church and Christian faith. Receive the Holy Spirit and go out into the service of God to do whatever they can do to help bring Jesus to this dying nation and dying world. Grant it, Father. Pass by us tonight, Father, and visit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing just one verse of that before we go any farther. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Me not, O gentle Savior.
Let's all believers raise our hands while we sing it real quietly. A spirit of worship now. Message is over. Let's worship the Lord. Let's just hum it. Eyes closed, just pray. Don't you love him? Tell me something greater than love. God is love. No one will ever be able to express how God is such love. He is a God of love, the greatest love of all. Now, I was just going to preach and make an altar call tonight, and then I got here. I was all turned around. I met Billy. I said, you give out any prayer cards? He said, nope, never give out any prayer cards. But we don't need any prayer cards for a healing service. Are you wanting, you think tonight, you love him, you believe he's the same Lord Jesus? You believe that your faith could reach up and say, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. I am needy, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. You believe you could touch him, cause him to turn around, say, Thy faith has saved thee. You believe you could do that out there without prayer cards? You believe you have faith enough to do it? You do raise up your hands. I believe I have faith. Oh, that's the way I like to see you put your hand up. I believe. All right. I know none of you, the Holy Spirit knows you all, but he's here. His presence is here, and he was here today. He would do just like he did then. If you had faith to touch him, he'd turn around. That's always what it did. Was that right? Faith is what touched him. The woman touched his garment. He turned around, said, who touched me? He looked all around till he found the little woman. He said, your blood issue stopped because your faith has saved you. See? Your faith did it. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? If blind Barnabas' his faith could stop him, if Philip standing there looking at him could go get Nathaniel, Nathaniel could be brought before him, and he told him where he was at before he left, when Andrew went and got his brother Simon Peter, or Simon it was then, and brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked over and said, Your name is Simon, your father was Jonas. That's the same Jesus tonight. See? Now, as far as healing or saving you, that's already done. You understand that, don't you? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Chastised by our pieces up on him, and with his stripes we were. Past it. Now, you and the cops, one in here, the other one, you and the cops, you out there, whatever disease, whatever you have, need for prayer, someone else, no matter what it is, God knows you and your faith. Now, he will do that. If he will do that, how many of you in the building will say, Lord, I love you. I believe that you're here. I appreciate you. I'm going to even renew my covenant with you. Would you do that? Say, I'll just, I'll renew myself to you. Now, precious friends, I'm your brother. This is the word of God. The Bible says that we've been preaching any newcomers here. We've been preaching this week and seeing the Holy Spirit do that. The Holy Spirit promised through Jesus Christ that in the last days he would do that same thing before the church 
just before his coming. How many has been here this week? You heard it called on Jesus that was the days of sovereignty. And the angel even had his back turned to the woman when he asked Abraham, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, in the tent behind you. And she laughed within herself. He said, why did she laugh? Jesus said that same thing will take place just before the coming of the Lord. It's the last time we've had healing. Watch when Jesus declared himself. The first thing he did, he was baptized by, with the Holy Ghost when John baptized him. The, we notice the next thing he started out in his ministry, he started healing the sick and his fame went everywhere. Is that right? Then when that taken place, the next thing, he began to show him the sign of the Messiah. And that's when he was rejected. That's when they crucified him and taken him up. Now, that's just exactly, we've come to the Holy Ghost baptism, the divine healing services. Now we've come into the great sign of his appearing among us. How happy we should be when we don't know what time the world will go into ashes. Do you know it could be possible before, before we leave this building that this earth could be blown up? Scientific says it's midnight right now. Time for it to happen. All scientists and everything is shaking everywhere. And remember, the church goes home before that takes place. Then how close is the coming of the Lord? Be ready. Be prepared, for we don't know what minute or hour he may appear. It might be at any time. We're receiving our last sign to the church of his coming. I want to pray for these handkerchiefs just a moment while we bow our heads. Precious Father, these handkerchiefs maybe goes to some poor precious mother, child, father, someone is suffering. We are taught in the Bible that they're taken from the body of St. Paul. Handkerchiefs or aprons. Unclean spirits went out of the people. Diseases were cured. Father, we know that we're not St. Paul, but we know that you are still Jesus. It wasn't Paul. And it was said one time that when the Red Sea had the children of Israel cut off from the Promised Land, that God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes, and the sea got scared, and it walled up, and Israel crossed over to the Promised Land on dry ground. Now, Father, when these handkerchiefs and little parcels is laid up on the sick, don't look as much as through the pillar of fire, but look through the blood of your own Son, who gave the promise. And may, whenever these parcels is laid on the sick, may the devil get scared. May you look upon him, Lord, and he'll know that this is sent from a meeting where people that are filled with your Spirit are praying sincerely. And may he depart from them, and they pass to that good and healthy place where the Scripture says, I would above all things that you prosper in health. We send them in Jesus' name for that purpose. Amen. Now, be reverent. How many is sick out there? Raise up your hands. Everywhere you are, just raise your hands. Everywhere in the building. Now, be reverent. Now, what a time. Breathless. Something's got to happen. Something's got to happen, or the Bible's found wrong and me a false pretender. Or it's going to be found true and our faith confirmed. Don't worry. Christ this year, he always, he promised it. He cannot do nothing but keep his promise. If you will believe with all your heart now, just have faith, don't doubt. Do you see that? A light hanging right here over this man right here. Got trouble with his eyes. That's right. You were praying. Your son sits next to you. You believe God can tell me what's wrong with your son? You believe it? It's a nervous condition. 
That's right, isn't it, son? Mm-hmm. You believe God can tell me who you are? Would it make you feel better? Mr. Cullum? That's Craig. See that light? Now you receive what you asked for. Same one. Here. Right here, a man sitting looking right at me. He's suffering with arthritis. He's had a heart attack. He's a minister. He isn't from this city. He's not even from this state. He's from Kansas. You believe that God can heal you, sir? you go back to Coffeeville and feel real good about it, would you? <laughs> Your name is Robert Midland. Go back and be healed, sir. I do not know you. If that's right, wave your hands like this. I'm a stranger to you. Your faith has saved you, sir. That was not me, my precious friend. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's out there among you. I'm just his mouthpiece, seeing with my eyes what he's doing. I wish you could see what I'm looking at now. Mm-hmm. See, it's his goodness. A man sitting right out here on the end, kind of a t-shirt or sleeve, short sleeve. He's praying for somebody else, though. He's praying for a man that's sitting right here. Looks like a Mexican man. You got stomach trouble, haven't you, sir? They haven't told you how. You believe God can tell me who you are? They call you Joe. <laughs> They didn't tell you how bad you were, sir, but go believing now. You can be well. <laughs> Have faith in God. Back in this section. If thou canst believe. Here's a woman sitting right down here, sitting second one in. She had her head down. She's praying, Oh, Lord God, let him t- call me. She ain't praying for herself. She's praying for her husband. Her husband had a nervous collapse. He's been attending the meetings, but he just couldn't come back. He's bed fast. And she's weeping over her handkerchief now in her eyes. For our poor husband lays just at the point of death with a nervous collapse. Fear not, sister. Take that handkerchief you're crying in and lay it up on him. Don't doubt. He'll come out of it. If thou can't believe. Here's a little woman sitting right out from her. That just struck faith with that little woman. She's praying also. Her trouble, she's got trouble with her head and with her eyes, and she's got a stomach trouble. It's a little woman. Wait a minute. Her name is Annie. Annie, stand up on your feet. Jesus Christ makes you well. <laughs> Do you love the Lord Jesus? Are you ready to receive his blessings? Do you believe me to be his servant? I've told you the truth. Now, I'll tell you this. Will you lay your hands on one another across there? Minister brothers, some of you faithful preachers there, come down here and lay hands along these people here. I want you, especially on this woman here. You lay your hands on one another up in the balconies, wherever you are. Now... Is Jesus, that man there with that prostrate trouble? Forget it, sir. Jesus Christ makes you well. Go home. You've been having pains in your lungs, sitting right back there next to that post? Don't have no fear. It's left you to Merkler. You can go home and be well. Christ Jesus makes you well. There it is. It's just all over the building, everywhere. Everywhere. Can't, oh... Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, a year my heart will cry. Oh, I long to die. not pass.
Now, through Jesus' name, give me praise. 